This is a basic simplified approach to the dizzy patient by me, Peter Johns, an emergency physician at the uh, University of Ottawa. Why did I make this presentation? Well, frankly, many emergency physicians cannot reliably diagnose the most common cause of vertigo, which can then lead to ordering CTs or MRIs, which are expensive and unwarranted. And the reason why they're having difficulty to Diagnosis is because the textbooks typically emphasize a is this a central or peripheral cause instead of saying well how do you make a diagnosis and also there's no videos in the textbooks. So you need to understand and look for the big three of vertigo and the big three are as follows BPBV which is somewhat distressing but curable and secondly is vestibular neuritis which is more distressing at times, but unfortunately no cure. Now, these two conditions you will see. You've got to understand and be able to diagnose them. BPBV and vestibular neuritis. That's two of the big three. And the big three, of course, the third big three is, of course, cerebellar stroke, because you don't want to miss a stroke. So just to be clear, BPVV and vestibular neuritis are both very common, but, and they should be easily distinguishable from each other. Cerebellar stroke is much less common, but more dangerous, and it could be written off as vestibular neuritis if you're not careful. So there's only really two things you have to do with my basic simplified approach, and that is, first of all, is the patient not dizzy now? and has no nystagmus when you assess their gaze, you have them look left or look right, but they have um, less than one minute episodes of vertigo brought on by changes of head position, then you should evaluate them for BPVV. If they have it, you should cure it with something like the epi maneuver, a particle repositioning maneuver. Now, contrary, if the patient has ongoing acute severe dizziness, otherwise known as acute vestibular syndrome, so they have vertigo and it's of course worsened by changes of head position because all vertigo is worse when you change head position and they have nystagmus when you assess their gaze if so then you look for strokes um, and you do this hints exam if the exam is reassuring you can discharge these patients home now you have to understand that this is not an exhaustive differential diagnosis for vertigo it's an introduction to allow you to make the diagnosis of the most common causes BPV and vestibular neuritis, and if you can confidently diagnose BPBV or vestibular neuritis, then you've ruled out stroke as a cause of their dizziness. There are many other conditions which can cause vertigo, but they're not as common as these, and you definitely need to understand the basic concepts here. So now we'll talk about the typical presentation of BPBV, which of course stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Whenever someone just says BPBV, they're usually talking about posterior canal BPBV, which is the most common cause. We'll talk about another cause in a minute. So the most important of the P's is the paroxysmal component. The episode of vertigo typically lasts 20 or 30 seconds. And in between these episodes, or paroxysms, they feel pretty much normal, but they aren't necessarily completely normal. They feel a wee bit off, but they don't have any ongoing significant spinning, or they're not lying there looking sick. And, of course, BPPV is positional, which means that it's initiated or started by moving your head, like getting up from bed, going down to, to lie down, bending over to pick something up, looking up, also, rolling over in bed is a very typical trigger of BPVV, and it's not very common to trigger other types of dizziness. Again, remember that all vertigo gets worse when you move your head. If you don't get worse when you move your head, you probably don't have vertigo. So vestibular neuritis and cerebellar stroke, their vertigo will worsen with head movement. But BPVV goes from zero dizziness to intense dizziness with head motion, and then goes away if the patients keep still in less than a minute. Many patients will feel nauseated and sweaty for longer than a minute, so they might say, oh, I was dizzy for 15 minutes or half an hour, but if you question them carefully, they'll just say, oh no, I was spinning only lasted for half a minute. So good questions to ask are, if it came on with a position change, how long do they feel dizzy for? 
if they played, stayed perfectly still, would they still be dizzy uh, or spinning? What's the longest time they were continuously spinning for? They say I was spinning for the whole morning for three hours. They don't have BPPV. When you examine these patients, they're usually seated and you can't really tell that they're being bothered by anything. And when you examine their gaze, when you ask them to look left or right, you will see no sustained nystagmus. So if you have a patient with brief episodes, 20 or 30 seconds, brought on by head position changes, and you have no ongoing dizziness, it goes away when they're still, and you have them look left and right, and you don't see any nystagmus, then you can go ahead and do a Dix-Hallpike test. The Dix-Hallpike test is only used to diagnose posterior canal BPBV. If they don't have BPBV by history, because they are having hours of dizziness, or you can see nystagmus, then the Dix-Hallpike is of no use to them, and it'll probably mislead you, because you'll see some kind of atypical response when you do the Dix-Hallpike test. So how do I feel about doing a Dix-Hallpike test on patients with ongoing vertigo or spontaneous nystagmus on gaze assessment? You're, you might as well waterboard them. You're going to torture them. You're going to make them feel bad. You're not going to learn anything valuable. So as a soup Nazi would say, if you have nystagmus, no Dix-Hallpike for you. Now, what do you see when you do a Dix-Hallpike test on someone who has BPVV? Here is a very typical response. The first thing you'll notice is when this lady's in the head hanging position with her left ear down is that she has no symptoms for the first two or three seconds. Then you'll note that she has vertical nystagmus upward. You can look at her pupils and see them as they're jerking upwards. And she has a very nice pigmentation at 12 o'clock on her iris. And you can watch that torting towards her downward left ear um, as it progresses. And it and has a crescendo, decrescendo kind of pattern. And it lasts about 15 seconds. Let's have a look at it. So she's down now in the dix position, one, two, three, nothing really happening then. Look at that vertical nystagmus. Pupils going up, 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 up. And see that little pigmentation on her 12 o'clock on her iris, how it's torting towards the downward ear. We're gonna see it, and now it's gone already. That's 15 seconds. Now, you'll see it in slow motion, a little closer up, and let's see how it's vertical. Nystagmus is vertical and torsional towards the downward ear. If you see this response, there is nothing in the world that will give you this except posterior canal BPBV. So don't be confused when you see the vertical nystagmus in the dix hallpike test and say, wow, you, you, you must be a central cause because central causes cause uh, vertical nystagmus. No, that's not it. When you do a Dix-Hallpike test and you see this upward vertical nystagmus with a torsional component towards the downward ear, it's a classic BPBB finding and don't worry. Now, it is true that if you see spontaneously occurring purely vertical, either upward or downward nystagmus, it's almost always caused by a central cause, but it's rarely seen even if you have a cerebellar stroke. In the HINT study, only 12% of the patients who had a central cause of the vertigo had vertical nystagmus. So what do you do if you see a typical positive dix hallpike test in someone who sounds like they have BPPV? Well, it's time to cure them with the Epley Maneuver. It only takes about six minutes or less to do. It's about 80% effective if you do it to the right patient the right way. If you repeat it, it becomes more effective than that. Uh, there are other maneuvers which exist, but the Epley is the simplest and the best studied. If you want to know how to do the Epley maneuver, just type Epley into the search bar of YouTube or put my name in there. You'll find my channel, my videos, and you'll you'll see how to diagnose Epley, uh, how to do the Epley maneuver and the uh, dix hallpike test. Now, what happens if you have someone who really sounds like BPVV, but but it's negative dix hallpike or or both sides seem to be some eyes jerking around. It could be horizontal canal BPBV, and that's a little more complicated if 
uh, you want to learn more about that, you can look up my YouTube video on how to diagnose and treat horizontal canal BBBV. Now, why should you do the Epley maneuver? Well, frankly, because you can take a patient who is looking like this. Okay, so we're going to have you turn your head the other way now. Nope, okay. this way. Yep. Are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. Hi. Oi. Uh, I got the easy. I yeah, can't. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's Oi. good. No, 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 no. Just keep your head like that. We can cure this, okay? Oi, we can cure I can't. This. You're okay. You're doing good. You're doing good. You're going to go away real soon. See, it's leaving. Real soon, okay? Uh, and we did cure this lady without starting an IV, taking blood, doing any imaging, referring, to, referring her to any specialists, and in fact arranging any follow-up. She just went home and she was fine. And you change a patient who looked like that distressed poor lady to somebody who looks like this. Okay, so you're feeling better? I do feel better. Are you glad we did that? I'm very glad we did that. Okay, the Epley maneuver. It seemed to work. Good. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Now, why would you not want to do the Epley Maneuver on somebody when you can get an outcome like that? So that's the end of part one to my basic simplified approach to the dizzy patient. And um, we covered th that, that below. The next part will cover if the patient has ongoing symptoms and nystagmus, what do you do then? Thanks for watching.